see the blood. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Don keeps me, uh, make sure I've got my mic on and all ready to go. So, appreciate that. All right. Today we want to talk about uh, the fact that there are biblical ways we can protect ourselves from false teachers and apostates. Uh, you know, the Great Wall of China was built to protect the Chinese people and uh, the different governments that were there. And it was constructed and did a great job, but there was uh, three times, that, uh, that, that maybe more, but there were three times it was known to be breached. And it was uh, mainly by a man named Kangnus Kong. And he was able to do that, not by force, but by bribery. He was able to bribe a guard. That's what they say. He was able to bribe a guard and able to uh, overcome the wall and be able to go over and uh, attack China. And you know, uh, a lot of times there's always a deception, isn't there, that causes something to fall. It's not so much of strength and military might, but a, a deception of some type. And sometimes that's what happens in our churches, if we're not, if we're not careful. Even in our lives as Christians, sometimes uh, because uh, we think we're strong, we think we're able to hold up, but actually it's when we're thinking that we're strong that sometimes we're weak because of pride. And that can happen with false teaching and error that can infiltrate the church. And... Our question here today is, when it comes to false teaching, are you earnestly contending for the faith? 
And that's what we see in the book of Jude. The book of Jude was written by... Uh, Jude is believed to be the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the church, he had a prominent place, and people appreciated him. He became a great follower of Jesus Christ and a great teacher in the church. And Jude says in the beginning paragraph, he says, you know, my desire was to write about salvation, all the blessings of our salvation. But because of people coming in, and he, he calls them, you know, mockers, okay? He calls them false teachers. Uh, we could even say wolves in sheep's clothing. Because they were infiltrating the church and creeping in, they were causing havoc among the members. And he says to them, he says, you know, I wanted to talk about salvation, but it was needful that I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says, that I needed to, I think the more pressing topic is that we need to guard ourselves against these preachers that claim to be true preachers, but they're not. And he wanted to just help them in this matter because he described them. Uh, we don't have time to read the whole chapter, but in verses 9 to uh, 16, he described these false teachers, and he described them as those who reject authority. They reject the authority, maybe it was the religious authority, the authority of the Word of God, or maybe it was the political authority, you know, rejecting the authority of the, of the government. But they rejected, they, they were against authority. And he says, that's a sign, that's a problem uh, th for that. Uh, they walked in error, all right? They lived their life in total error, living contrary to the Word of God. They led falsely. They lied. Okay? They lied about who they were. They lied about what they were doing. They deceived people. And he also says they had one, one object, and that was to please themselves. They didn't care about anybody else. They didn't care about who they hurt. It was that they pleased themselves, sometimes even doing things that were wrong and unethical, so they could just be happy. And he says those were, those were the things that they were doing. And at the end here, verses 17 to 23, I want to look at some instructions Jude gave to help us to keep from stumbling into error, okay? And I use that word stumbling because we see in verse 24, Notice it says, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling or stumbling. They're going to, you know, that's kind of like the false teachers. They don't put something directly in your path to stop you. No, they just put something, a little thing, you know, a little bit of false teaching to get you to maybe doubt what you believe or to make you, cause you to doubt the teaching of the Word of God or what you've known to be true. And that's like a stumble. And once you get that stumbling, once you start that downward path, it's not very far till you fall. And that's what we want to look at here today, and I've got three instructions from Jude. Number one, as we get right into the message here, remember God's Word. Remember God's Word. Notice he says in verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that word, that spoken word. Now you've got to remember, at this time, they didn't have the New Testament in a, you know, a, a combined form. They may have, at this time, when Jude wrote, they might have had some various letters that had been collected from the apostles, such as men like Peter, John the Apostle, the Beloved, and the Apostle Paul. They had sent out letters, and they circulated among the churches, and they were collected and believed to be the inerrant Word of God. And they had some of these letters, but it wasn't compiled for us like we have the New Testament today. What a blessing it is to have God's Word and to have it before us and compiled together. And all we have to do is crack open a, the Bible, and we have this truth. And so he says, listen, I want, to, I want you to remember what these men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit have said about them, about what they have said, uh, about what they said about them. Uh, and they described them. 
And what did Peter say about false teachers? Well, you can turn there if you want to. Uh, I'll read it for you. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Peter said, I'm not using the whole segment, the whole paragraph, just parts of it, but it said, he said, who privily, who being these false teachers, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. All right, they don't get up in front of you and say, now listen, I'm teaching falsehood. They don't do that. They, act, they, they, they tell you this is true, but it's not. So they... they, 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 they they, they uh, pretend they're preaching truth. They deny the Lord that bought them. They deny the deity of Christ. And through covetousness, they use, they, with feigned words, make you, make you merchandise of you. Peter's saying that all their desire is to make money. That's what it's all about. They want to make money off of you. That's, all, uh, you know, that's their number one desire is to make money. So be careful. Remember what... So he, he says, remember what these men said. And that's what Peter said. What did John say? Well, John said this, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. He said, it is the last time, or meaning we're living in the last days, okay? There be many antichrist. All right? Many who deny who Jesus Christ is, who deny the deity of Christ. They went out from us, but were not of us. John saying, they're not even saved. They came in acting like they were. They deceived us. All they had all the right words. They used all the right language. But now we can see that they weren't even saved. They were lost. They were antichrist. And then the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He said, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Meaning they get up, they lie. They know they're lying. They're lying to deceive you, and it doesn't even bother them. They have no conscience. They don't care. And again, most likely, they're lost. They're unsaved, and they don't care who gets hurt. They don't care who they're destroying and what happens to you. All right, they've got a hard conscience. And that describes these people, these false teachers. So be careful. So we have the word. Remember these words. Remember what these men said. And of course, it's now in the Bible what they have said. And why did they say it? Why did they say these things? Were they just mean old men? Those mean old preachers? You know? <laughs> no, they said it because they saw what they did. They witnessed what happened to churches. They witnessed what happened to people? What did they witness? Well, notice it says in verse 18, how they have told you there should be mockers in last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, not having the Spirit. He witnessed how they divided churches. That's what they wanted. They divide people. Let's bring division. They divided the churches. They deceived the churches. They deceived people into following their false teaching. And they preyed on those who were lacking discernment. Maybe those who were just new to the faith. Maybe they were just one to Christ. Just entering their life as a believer. And they attacked them and preyed upon them. And was able to overcome them. Because they lacked the discernment of the teaching of the Word of God. Don't be that person. Don't be that person that, they'll, that they pray on. And so we have, let's, he says, one instruction, remember God's Word. And then number two, build your Christian life. Build your Christian life. Notice he says in verse 20, but ye beloved, all right, that's beloved, he's talking to believers. 
the true believers, those who are saved. He says, but ye beloved, building up yourselves. The word building there means to be strengthening. Okay? It means to edify. Just like you would take a, you know, something that's weak. Sometimes I see where people have planted trees and they'll build something to help them stand until they get strong enough to stand on their own. They'll put some, maybe some <clears throat> supports down and tire, wire them off or t tie them off to them so it will grow straight and not get blown over. So we need some edifying. He says, build yourself up. Of course, we got the preaching of the Word of God. We got the, the, but we can do things ourselves to protect ourselves from being deceived. What's he, and so let's look at these four things. There's four things he's going to mention here very quickly. Building up yourselves of your, on your most holy faith. What's he referring there to? He says, listen, keep learning. Keep studying the Bible. You know what you believe. <laughs> You've been taught the truths of God's Word. Now just keep studying. Keep, keep learning. You know, we never quit learning, do we? And that's the great thing about the Bible. You, you know, you can say, well, I've read the Bible through. I don't need to read it again. No, I wouldn't say that. Read the Bible over again. Read it over and over and over again. Because every time you read it again, you're going to learn something new. Why? Because the Bible is that deep. What you didn't know before, you come to light. The Holy Spirit is always bringing truth to light in your mind. So keep reading the Bible. I know I say that over and over again. Some people probably say, Preacher, I wish you'd quit saying that. We hear it over and over and over. But it's true. <laughs> because that's, the, you know, that's where the devil will tell you. You don't need to study. don't need. You know it all. Well, you don't know everything. Build up. Edify. Strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Not only that, but he says also... Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Spirit. This is praying on a regular basis. Knowing. Knowing what? Knowing that the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. And the, Jesus Christ, we know from Hebrews chapter 4, that when we pray, our request is taken to Christ, and Christ takes our request to the throne of God the Father, and there He pleads on our behalf. He's our advocate. So what do we need to pray for? We need to pray for other believers. We need to pray for power. Power for the church. Power for ourselves. Power for others so that they can live their life and be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit and know God's will. We need to pray. Let's keep praying. So we keep studying the Word of God. We're continually praying on others and on ourselves, on our, for, for ourselves. And we're continually being faithful so we can be guided and directed and not be led into error. And not only that, but he says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Guarding yourself. You know what you want to protect as a believer? And, I'm, and this is just reiterating what you already know. But you want to guard that relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to guard that. You want to keep in the love. You want to keep that love, that strong relationship. Just like a man and a woman who give, come together to get married. And they're married. You know what they need to do? They need to strengthen. They need to guard that relationship. Why? Because if they don't, someone's going to come in and tear them apart and destroy what God has put together. And you can. And we all know from experience the havoc that that causes in families. We see it all around us. That's the same way in our Christian life. We want to guard our relationship with Him. 
keeping, keep yourselves in the love of God. And one of the, you know, there's many ways we can guard our relationship with Christ. But let's say this, one way is that we can remain faithful and obedient to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just be obedient. Obey Him and follow Him. And you know, by doing so, Jesus said to His own disciples in John chapter 15, Abide with me. You want to bear fruit? You want your prayers answered? Abide, continue, remain in me. Keep that relationship strong. And one way we can do that is by obeying His commandments. And then, fourthly, He says in verse 20, 21, the latter part there, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The word looking is, an, is, a expect, is waiting. You're expecting something. You're waiting for that to happen. Just like when you order something from Amazon. And you've ordered that online, and they've said it's going to be there on a certain day, and it doesn't come. And you're looking out, right? You're watching. You're saying, okay, it didn't come today, but maybe it's going to come tomorrow. And, you, and maybe you can't be at home, so you got your neighbor looking out for you. Because we don't want these porch pirates coming along and taking your stuff. So we're always looking, watching. Oh, there it is. Let's get out and get it. Let's bring it inside. Well, that's like it is with Christ. Christ has said, I'm returning. I'm coming again. We need to be looking. We need to be expecting His return at any time. And that will help us. That will help us to have a right attitude and a right frame of mind. Because when He comes, we want to be ready. When He appears, we want to be ready. We want to be ready for His return. Not, not dabbling in the sin, not being unfaithful, but we want to be ready so we can stand before Him without anything again that would deter our ability to enjoy that moment that we'll be with Him. And then point number three. So we, we remember God's Word. We build up our Christian life. These four things that He mentions. And then exercise spiritual discernment. The final thing we need is discernment. And sometimes this is where Christians have gone awry. They were good at the first two. They remembered God's Word. They built up their life. They were building. They were strengthening themselves. But you know, they had some misguided compassion. Misguided compassion. And because of the lack of discernment, they compromised. And they end up falling anyways. And James warns against that. We need some spiritual discernment. Notice he says in verse 23, And others save with fear. I'm sorry, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Here he's referring to those who have been deceived. All right, he's referring to those that have, are following these false teachers. And he says, how are we to respond to them? What are we to do? He says, listen, some of them, some of them more likely are true believers. They actually did get saved, but for one reason or another, they got caught up. And they, got, they were deceived. And they began to follow this false teaching. He says, to them, we need to show compassion. Show some patience. And let's work with them. Let's try to bring them back through patience and compassion and kindness. Let's try to bring them back to where they need to be. So, so towards the doubting, towards the wavering, towards those who, are, who may be just on the brink of falling away, 
Let's have a little compassion. Let's have a little tenderness. Let's have a little kindness. And through the teaching of God's Word, let's bring them back to the truth if they will come. If they will come. Maybe they won't listen. Maybe they've gone too far. But if it's a chance, let's try compassion. That may win them. And then he says, not only that, but verse 23, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire towards the burning. These most likely are people who are unsaved. All right? And, and not the fact that he's talking about the fire is referencing hell, <laughs> but it's the, in, it's the intensity Okay, the intensity. These people are lost. And they need to be woken up to the truth. You know, if, you, if your neighbor, his house or her house was on fire, would you go up and ring the doorbell and wait for them to answer? No, you're going to pound on that door and you're going to maybe break down that door or do whatever you can to say, get up! Especially if it's in the middle of the night. Get out! Get out! This place is on fire! And the fire trucks are coming. And, you know, I was driving the bus there Friday morning. I was down on Chapel Street going to, you know, buy someone's stop. And... Sure enough, at the end of the street, the fire truck was going on the corner of Chapel and, I forget the name of the street there, but on the corner there, just down from Albion, that apartment building was on fire. And, it was, and it, you could just see the, I could just see the smoke coming out of the top of that building. Now, I, I, I can't, I think it was the fourth floor they might have said, but somewhere up there, there was a fire. And, and I had gone around, and because I was, my attention was on the smoke in the building, I forgot about my stop. <laughs> I got distracted, and I had to turn her back around, and oh boy, did I forget that person? I better go back and see if he's out there. But they weren't there, so all was well. And I continued on, turned down Willow, all right, went down Willow, and was able to go to, I was going to Superior Heights, and another truck was coming. And they were, had sirens going, and they were getting there as fast as possible. Why? Because there was an immediate danger. And, you know, those firemen, they got there, and they were able to help those people. And thankfully, nobody was hurt. But there's the intensity, and that's what Judas says. Listen, there is, there is the burning, those who need our help. Let's, we just need to give them the truth. All right? They need to be woken up because they're lost. And then towards the dangerous. Towards the dangerous. Notice it says in verse 23, at the end of that verse, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now maybe in this section, Jude is talking about maybe the false teachers themselves. Or maybe those who have just so ingrained and have followed that teaching that, uh, you know, they're dangerous. And he says to, he says to the, these believers, be careful. You can try to win them. But be careful. Don't let them corrupt you. You say, well, if I can get up close enough and if I can become their friends, maybe I can win them. Listen, be careful because they have corrupted themselves and if you don't separate from them, if you get tied to them and you're associating with them to a point where they will corrupt you. That's what he says there. The garment spotted by the flesh. They are defiled. What they believe is defiling them. Don't get, allow them to corrupt you because of your association with them. Be careful. And that's where we need discernment more than ever. How close is too close? Sometimes it's, you know, it's a fine line. And we've seen that today. 
We've seen where people have gone, you know, they, they haven't separated themselves properly according to Scripture. The Bible teaches biblical separation. And they've got too close and it wasn't very long before they're falling and doing things that they would not have done. Because they didn't heed this warning. They didn't have the discernment. We need that discernment, that spiritual discernment. Yes, we can try to win them, but let's know also we don't want them to defile us. In conclusion today, a strong defense depends on strong people. And this applies to spiritual battles as well as to military contests. We need a strong defense. We're not talking about a, a physical defense. We're talking about a spiritual defense. We're talking about the ability to be able to understand false doctrine, false teaching, and, and know it when we see it. And then to be able to deal with it in a proper way, protecting ourselves and how to associate with those who are involved in it. And that's important. Because if we don't, then we could stumble and fall ourselves. There was a family back in 2011 when a tornado came through their area and they were caught off guard. And they were outside and they couldn't find safety. They couldn't find shelter. So all they could do was go to the woods. Find us a, a area, an area that was wooded area, and they had some rope. And there was a family, a father and a mother and some children, and they took the rope and wrapped their kids around together and kept, you know, tied them off. And then mom and dad held on for their dear life. And the storm came through. And they said they could, they could feel the dust and debris, you know, going over them, but they, but they held together and they're able to, to pass and to get through the storm. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13 says, Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go, keep her, for she is thy life. Just like that family that held together. All right, mom and dad, they held on to those kids. They held on to the rope as tight as they could. Listen, let's hold on to what we know is true. And let's don't let it go. And when the storms come, we will be, uh, we'll be able to hold together and we'll be able to get through it. Just bringing attention to verse 24 in conclusion here, we see a doxology. James gives a, a little song of praise at the end here. He says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. James says, listen, our Savior, Jesus Christ, one day we're going to see him again. And we're going to be presented to him as the bride of Christ. And he's going to present us to his Father. And one day we're going to bow down before him. What? That's going to be a great time. That's going to be an amazing time. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? All right, staying faithful, remaining faithful, because there's a greater time coming. There's a better world coming than this world. And he says, let's, let's stay faithful, because we know what's coming. It's going to be a time of exceeding joy. And then he says, verse 30, 25, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever." Amen. We have a great God. We have a great Savior. And He's able to keep us. He's able to, to keep us strong. But we have to do our part too. We have to hold on. And one day we're going to see Him, our wise God and our Savior. And we're going to see His glory, His majesty, His dominion, and His power forever. You see, the coming of Christ and, and all of that is just the beginning of eternity. And that's what we have to look forward to. Let's stay faithful. And let's encourage others to remain faithful in the days in which we live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for the Word of God, the warnings, and the encouragements, and the exhortations that it gives. Lord, help us to be faithful. 
Help us to remain faithful until Jesus comes again or until you call us home. Now, Lord, bless us now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.